Hello everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about robot anatomy and cognitive architectures. Essentially, how are we going to be uh, representing and thinking about a robot's body and its mind? Uh, so let's start talking about the robot's body. So although we have many different types of forms of robots, ranging from mobile robots to very complex robots like humanoids, uh, we can represent them in a common language. So all robots need to exist physically in uh, either uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. We can oftentimes model mobile robots as existing in two dimensions, although most other robots will have to start thinking in 3D. Each of these robots is consisting of some parts, uh, which are called links. Uh, these are somewhat rigid uh, components uh, that are then connected by joints, which move. Uh, the joints can be rotational, such as the joints in a human body, or they can also be translational, such as pistons uh, that you see in construction equipment, for example. These joints are typically considered rigid. Uh, they may be somewhat flexible, but they're typically considered quite rigid. Uh, and there's typically a privileged base link or body link, which is uh, either fixed to the environment or it could also float in the environment, such as uh, in a mobile robot or in a legged robot. We also have some sort of source of movement of these uh, links and, and joints. Uh, so these actuation, uh, these components consist of some sort of generator of mechanical force, usually electric motors, uh, but can also be uh, other types of uh, pneumatics and hydraulics, etc. And then the forces are then transmitted to the links uh, through, the, through the gearbox or through a cable drive system or also wheels on the ground. Finally, we require some sort of sensors to be mounted on the links. So joint encoders, for example, provide a sense called proprioception, where the robot can tell where it is in space. Uh, vision is provided through cameras. Uh, cameras are very cheap and they, are, they provide very rich sources of information uh, to, uh, to most robots. Uh, but we can also have other forms of sensors like laser rangefinders, sonars, tactile sensors, etc. Now, uh, when we try to model how the robot interacts with a, the, the body interacts with the mind and the body also, also has to interact with the environment, we can build this mind-body environment model. So on the right is the environment, which provides the external sort of source of, uh, of, of uh, kind of context for the robot's body. Uh, the robot's body then interacts with the environment through its links and joints and uh, also through its sensors. So the links and joints provide force against the environment to pick up objects or to move forward uh, if you're uh, driving a car, uh, uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, it, the environment also provides information into the sensors. Now, the sensors provide into the mind the first part of the mind-body inter uh, environment interaction, which is called the percepts. The percepts can then be processed through some sort of magic box. We're going to be studying how to implement this magic box in, uh, in, in this class in great detail. Uh, it does some processing on those percepts, and then it then produces some sort of signals to act. So these are called the actions. Now those actions go out to the actuator. They then get transmitted uh, back into links and joints, and then, uh, and then they affect the environment. Now, in this course, we're going to try to figure out how to uh, implement that left side magic box, that question mark that we're seeing inside the robot's mind. And we have to get rid of many of our preconceived notions of how we think uh, in order to implement an intelligent robot. The essential component is that these, the intelligent behavior of the robot, the appearance of intelligent behavior, is controlled by the algorithms that we develop. These algorithms need to process sensor input, uh, predict what ha might happen in the world if we were to do certain uh, things, and also then plan to uh, produce sequence, uh, sequences of actions which we can then output to our low-level motors. So these algorithms can be quite complex, uh, and they have to be very carefully designed. We can't just think about this as a form of scripting. It's not as easy as for loops and if statements. Uh, these can get you so only so far. Uh, they can do simple things like maze following, uh, but they can't do complex things like grasp planning and, and other type forms of manipulation that we need to uh, try to achieve in this course. So let's figure out how to do this. So let's think about the key part over here on the left. So the robot's mind uh, takes in these signals called percepts and then outputs these actions. And this middle box here is where the, all the planning happens. This is also known as the sense plan act paradigm. So the sensing component is the top arrow here. Uh, the planning is the big question mark. And then acting is the bottom arrow uh, outputting uh, signals from the robot's mind. Now, how do we then 
plan to achieve good behavior? Well, we have to define good behavior in the first place. And this is not something that we can do necessarily without reference to the external task. We need to actually understand what the task is trying to, what we're trying to do with the robot here. Uh, there has to be some sort of definition of a performance metric. So this is typically a numeric me measure or a set of measures uh, that provides some sort of signal about whether we're doing well or not. So this can also be called a reward signal. It can be called a cost, a loss, an error. If you're talking about a business process, it could also be a key performance indicator. Uh, and this is something that has to be defined externally to the robot itself. We also have to design, we have to decide though, uh, you know, how are we going to implement the intelligence of the robot to achieve good behavior and also how how strongly do we want to try to strive for optimal performance? Or do we just want to perform good enough? So there's many different types of architectures that people have put together to try to implement the uh, cognition of the robot. And we'll be talking about uh, several of these uh, in just for this class. For, for, the, um, for the most part, we'll be focusing on the bottom four rows. The top two rows are essentially too simple for us to uh, implement any kind of interesting manipulation tasks. So uh, the simple reflex architecture, uh, though, we'll, we'll talk about just as a, uh, just for context, uh, this takes in the percepts. It performs some minimal processing called perception. It then takes the representation of what the kind of representation of the world is, the state of the robot and, and the environment. And then it processes that through some set of rules. So uh, examples of simple reflex cognitive architectures could be, for example, servo motors, uh, which simply take the uh, readings of the encoders and drives the motor uh, to try to reach a certain type, of, a certain uh, desired set point. Automatic doors in grocery stores also form uh, follow this type of architecture. So these are almost not even robots. These are very uh, can be very simple uh, types of, uh, of systems. Uh, but factory automation oftentimes works in a simple reflex fashion. Um, you know, essentially, if, if an object arrives, uh, you execute motion one. Uh, then you sense that the object is in location B, and then you go and execute motion uh, motion two. So um, slightly more complex than this is a model-based reflex controller. Uh, the big difference here is that it encodes a bit of memory into the system. Uh, so here it has this state estimate. So it tries to understand a bit of what is happening in the world uh, through this estimator uh, and, and some memory. Uh, you can do some more sophisticated tasks like quad rotor station keeping or uh, path tracking, uh, aircraft autopilots, uh, collision avoidance braking systems by, you know, they, they still have simple rules to generate the actions, but they do a bit of memory to try to understand what's going on in the world. Um, but we'll be focusing mostly on these uh, deliberative architectures uh, on the bottom four rows. So the first deliberative architecture uh, replaces the rules in the model-based reflex controller with a more sophisticated component, which is called a planner. So this planner uh, actually tries to model how things change in the world using some dynamics model and possibly a sensor model as well. It predicts the state that might occur through possible future actions. These actions are generated through some sort of mechanism. There's many different action generation mechanisms we'll talk about in this class. Um, but it predicts multiple states and then tries to pick the action that's the best through some sort of performance tester. Now, here's a case in which we can take that performance metric that is part of the problem domain and actually explicitly select the best predicted action. So the kind of philosophy behind a deliberative architecture comes from uh, the cybernetics community. There's this idea that every good regulator of a system must be a model of the system. And you can see here we have the sensor model and dynamics model, which try to predict how the external world outside of the robot's mind uh, actually behaves according to its actions. So um, in contrast, we have reinforcement learning architectures, which are gaining some popularity. Uh, here, uh, the, there's still like model-based reflex architectures, although they introduce a learning component to change the rules according to the observed state and also the reward signal. So the rules are changed into what's known as a policy. The learner then updates the policy to try to seek better rewards. Um, and so this philosophy of reinforcement learning is essentially models schmodels. You know, let's not model anything about the world. Let's just try to change our rules to try to get better rewards. 
Uh, and some extreme case of this is to do what's known as end-to-end -end reinforcement learning, where we get rid of any kind of perception component uh, altogether, and we just directly input the percept inputs into the learning procedure. And we'll talk a little bit about this at the end of the class. Um, another form of introducing learning into uh, cognition is through adaptive deliberative architectures, where the adaptation changes the way that the, uh, that the robot predicts what might occur given a certain set of actions. So the learning is injected here in which we observe the action, we observe the state, and then we modify the dynamics model to predict what happened in the real world more accurately. So in manipulation, if I were to, say, try to pick something up and it ends up slipping, I can then update my estimate of the friction that, uh, that occurred between my fingers and the, and the object. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, we'll talk about affordance-based deliberative architectures in which the learning happens not at the dynamics model component, but at the action generation component. So here, the notion of an affordance is a, is a thing that we can do in the environment. Uh, this comes from the uh, cognitive science literature. And the idea is that we can take things that we've done that have performed well, and we can learn to predict uh, or to generate candidate actions that are high performance. So this is kind of a little bit abstract for now, but we'll talk about one specifically in this course, which is image-based grasp prediction. So the idea is that we have an image, we're going to predict locations that are good for grasping, and these will be candidates that we can then evaluate using the rest of the, of the planning pipeline. Okay, one other final aspect of cognitive architectures that is characteristic of most robots is hierarchy. Uh, so oftentimes there are, it's not just a single monolithic planner that generates actions, but actually we have two levels of planning. So there typically is a slower component, which is a motion planner, uh, and this can take slower aspects of the state that are updated at a, low, a slower rate, such as vision, obstacles, and mapping, uh, which might only be updated a couple of times per second. Uh, and then it produces outputs like a path that can then be consumed by some other system that works upon a fast state. So for example, joint encoders or force torque sensors, are they update typically hundreds of times per second, and we can do very responsive tracking of the path. Uh, even some, some minor obstacle avoidance can be done at this fast rate, typically at the rate of, of several hundred hertz, which then ultimately produces the, the motor control action. Um, so we can also uh, have multiple levels of hierarchy. So if you have especially slow states, uh, such as user inputs or intermittent communication, uh, these can go into very high level mission level planners. Uh, these then can provide sub goals which go into the motion planner and then the rest of that kind of medium to fast set of, uh, of levels of the hierarchy can then operate on those sub goals. Okay, so as a recap, uh, we can describe all sorts of robots using links, joints, actuators, and sensors. Um, they describe the body of the robot. And in terms of implementing the mind, the cognitive aspect of the robot, uh, we've looked at the sense plan act framework and different ways of implementing that internal planning component. Some questions for you to uh, reflect on. Uh, well, one is, why is it difficult to implement intelligence without deliberation? What are the different roles of perception, prediction, and planning inside this deliberation? And also, what are the different types of roles that learning can play in this sense plan act framework? I'll see you next time.